I am Shantae Burns Simpson, and today I celebrate my first day uh, serving as BCALA's president. So thank you. This is my very first program as president, and I'm really, really thrilled uh, to be doing this. It is my delight to represent the nation's Black librarians. Joining us today are two comrades, allies, Gw Gwendolyn Reese and Mary Evangeliste, who will tell you a little bit more about themselves. Um, I know we have Mary right now, so do you want to talk about yourself right now? Sure, and then hopefully we will get Gwendolyn on the line. Hi, um, I am so honored to be here. Thank you, Shantae. Thank you to the Black Caucus of the American Library Association for having Gwendolyn and I. My name is Mary Evangeliste, and I have been a librarian for about 15 years in all kinds of different ways, academic, public, uh, all kinds of things like that. And now I am teaching at San Jose State University. I got to teach the first civic literacy course in January, and I am giving about a third of my time to the local, local activism here in Arizona. And I would love for y'all to hear from Gwendolyn, but I don't think she's on yet. So we'll have to get her to talk a little later. Thank you so much, Mary. Yes, yeah, she will join us soon, hopefully. And thank you to all of our participants for joining us. In its 50 year history, BCLA has been a vocal advocate for African American communities. I'm sorry, let's change the slide. Activism has always been a part of our mission and vision. Black librarians have tackled issues such as segregation within and beyond library facilities, as well as the longstanding lack of diversity in the LIS professions. This month, we are responding to calls for greater advocacy and engagement. In this session, we focus on voter engagement in libraries. Next slide. Before I turn it over to our colleagues, I want to point out key ALA resources. ALA has compiled two kits and handouts on promoting voter participation. This information will be distributed to registrants after today's session. These are great places to get started. Gwendolyn and Mary will share their approach as well. Next slide. And we also want to highlight that September 22nd, 2020 marks National Voter Registration Day. ALA is a key partner. You can sign up to receive information and ideas on programming. This is the perfect time to get started. And now without further ado, I will turn the session over to Mary at this point and then soon Gwendolyn. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Shantae. So um, originally, probably many of you have uh, talked to specifically probably me at uh, midwinter this year because I was running around like a maniac trying to get you all to sign up for absentee ballot day. Um, but now that we are faced with a whole bunch of other things, we are going to try to uh, move this to an absentee ballot week. And so Gwendolyn and I are going to be talking to you about overall uh, um, activism and also the proof of concept that she worked on at American University and how we're going to try to make that into a virtual event. So the name of this uh, webinar is Power, Justice, and Votes. And I work very closely with the local um, progressive groups in uh, Arizona. And the truth is, is that we all know that power never gives up anything. We have to fight for everything that we want. And uh, now we are in such a pivotal time in this election. This election is probably the most important of our lives. But then after this election, then we will just start working on, um, I think, a 10 year plan to dismantle uh, all the different uh, forms of white supremacy, and we really have to dedicate probably about a decade to that. And how will we do that? We will win 
city by city, county by county, and state by state. Uh, we know from COVID and its disproportionate uh, impact on Black people that we will get no help from our governors um, if they choose to be in alignment with this administration. We know that uh, both Florida and Georgia governorship were stolen from us. Now we see, look what's going on in Florida. Look what's going on in Georgia. It would be a very different situation if Stacey Abrams had won Georgia and Andrew Gillum would have won Florida. Many, many of our people would still be alive right now. So we see in COVID that um, mostly in the red states, we're seeing that, and we see this in Arizona, that our, our mayor has had to push up, our county supervisors have had to push up, and we've had to spend about 60% of our advocacy energy on just getting our governor in Arizona to have mandatory masks. So it's a mess. We have no social cohesion in this country. So we have to win city by city, county by county, state by state. And if we want to demand, um, and I know most of us want to defund the police, we want to figure out how to get budgets away from all this militarized police, we have to do that in the local elections. Uh, in Arizona, we have an extremely important county attorney election coming up that could really change the course of how we police and how we put or don't put people in prisons in Arizona. So we have to stay very, very aware of our local elections. And when we talk about Black Americans, I would say that um, I, I use this quote from Nicole Hannah-Jones, who is the creator of the New York Times 1619 Project that it is always Black Americans who show us what democracy can be. And when we fight together, we all make I, a better America. Can you tell, can you see me? Okay, so first off, we talk about the fact that this is a pivotal election. We talked about this in our practice. I know that everybody's talking about this with the people that they know. So the number one thing that I'm going to advocate for is that we all get everyone we know and everyone we love to vote by mail. Once again, we will not have a magic bill passed by the federal government to vote by mail. It will not happen. It will not pass the Senate with Mitch McConnell. So once again, we have to rely on our cities, our counties, and our states. So I am advocating that we all vote by mail for three reasons. First off, we have no idea what our states are gonna be like in October, November, and we have to keep ourselves safe. Once again, we know that many of our mature people in our communities want to go to the polls. They fought to go to the polls. I totally understand why they wanna to go to the polls, but this year it is much better to talk everybody into voting by mail so that we can stay safe and stay alive for this fight. The second, uh, the second problem or the second good part about voting by mail is we've seen this in Georgia just recently, is that we know that in places that have disproportionate, when, we, when, when the population is mostly black folk, we know that they're going to shut the polling place down or they're going to limit it to the point where it's going to be hard for all of us to get there. So in anticipation of that, just try to get people to vote by mail. And not only are there gonna be very little polling places available for us, there's also the, just the general overall polling problems that people Black people always face in polling places. Now, the third one really works for us as librarians. And I try to sell this very hard, is that um, when we vote by mail, we can sit down with all of our guides, we can sit down with uh, all the different things and we can do research. And if I can't sell the third one to all the librarians, who can I sell that to? So, when we started talking about the absentee ballot initiative with many of you um, were involved with us when we started, 
is that on campuses, we kind of have a whole other different um, mechanism. So we have a lot of people that a lot of activists are doing get out the vote on campuses. And Gwendolyn and I are trying to say like, that's great, but be very careful because there's a lot of differences with students. So when a student votes, um, it's great. It's perfect. It's their first vote. We want them to vote. But the problem is if they vote, if they, if they register to vote on campus, they end up moving quite a few times. And every time they move, they have to re-register. And that's, you know, that's low on the priority list of a student, especially right now. So um, it's much better for them when we're in a normal state, not so much now, um, for them to vote absentee ballot. And Gwendolyn will talk more about that in specific to the DC area. So what we found when we were talking about this is that if we are all in person sometime soon, I hope, that it's a great opportunity for students to interact and learn about civic literacy kind of on their own. So one of the things that we really have to be aware of is that even though, uh, of course, many of us are very dedicated to voting consistently and all the time, that there are many obstacles to students voting. Even if a student is, let's say, going to University of Michigan and Ann Arbor is, I mean, they're going to University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and they want to vote in Detroit, they still have a lot of obstacles. A, they have to get to Detroit, so they have to have transportation to Detroit. They have to have money to put gas in their car or money to take the bus. And then third, they have to take time off of their classes. We do not get election day off. Election day should be a holiday, but it isn't right now. So absentee ballot, in, in, in a normal world, remove many of these obstacles. And once again, yet another example from Arizona where I live, um, we talk about, oh, well, this student's from Yuma, it's not that far away, they can get home. Well, a 237 mile drive in 105 degree heat is not an easy thing to do. And once again, you have to have a reliable car, you have to have time. So we just wanna be very aware of removing the obstacles from our students so that they can vote. So um, much of mail-in ballots and absentee ballots kind of overlap. So um, a lot of the good reasons for them overlap. So once again, what we talked about before that a, um, one of the great things about mail-in ballots is that you get to do research, you get to make informed decisions. You're not just standing there at um, the polling place kind of, you know, voting depending on whatever else. And um, also what we're finding now is that students are becoming activists so early that we really, really want to keep them connected to their state. There's no reason that they should have to learn another state. And the good news is that they are extremely eager to vote. So what we saw in the 2018 midterm elections is we saw an increase um, from, we saw a great increase uh, in 18 to 29 year old voters. They increased from 16 to 20% in 2014 to 36%. So if you look at that, that's almost a 20% jump. They're ready to vote, they want to vote, they want to be part of making this new democracy for all of us, and we want to make it easy for them to do that. So when I got, well, Gwendolyn and I have known each other forever. We worked for almost a decade together at American University in Washington, DC. And for me, Gwendolyn's always been an intellectual heavyweight. And, um, one of, and, and she's mortified by this, but one of the quotes that she had that just really struck me, and I think we should all seriously think about this, and this is about school libraries, this is about public libraries, except that public libraries do a much better job than us as academic libraries, that we often, as academic libraries, help people with their careers, but we really must integrate the fundamental goal of helping our students become empowered, information literate, global citizens. So with that, um, I'm probably, I mortified Gwendolyn, but I'm gonna hand the mic to her. 
Thank you, Mary. Um, can you all hear me? And I, I am so sorry for all the technical challenges and I'm so happy to be here. Um, so in 2018, on September 25th, American University held its first absentee ballot day. And this was something that we chose to do because, um, you know, we are in the District of Columbia. And so we do not have full voter rights, as I'm sure you are all very aware. So this is something that we were able to do. And we helped 1,005 students request absentee ballots. So um, what we're going to do here is I'm going to go through what we did. But then I also want to be sure that I am clear that we have been thinking about how do we do this in this COVID environment. So I'm going to be giving a, kind of an overview of what we did, which hopefully at some point in time in a future election, we can redo it that way. But in the meantime, uh, we also are going to talk a little bit about how to kind of pivot for this instance. So Mary. So basically, why do we want to do this? Um, it's very important for us to encourage early voting experience because some of what we know from research is that people's first experiences when they are first eligible to vote basically determine largely their behavior as far as their voting behavior for the rest of their lives. Also, this assists us in exercising, helping us assist students in exercising their fundamental rights as, as citizens. And within an academic environment, it enables positive partnership, especially with student government, which was incredibly valuable. So from the perspective of civic literacy, a couple of the other things that I think are really important is that it does center the library as a place of civic engagement. And in particular, I think that is critically important for academic libraries because we want them to be associating libraries both when they're there as students, but also when they leave and they graduate and they go out and are thinking about their public libraries as places of empowerment for civic engagement. And it also allows us as librarians, as people who work in libraries to direct students towards these very useful nonpartisan sources to help inform critical decision making. And I'll speak a little bit more about this later, but we especially drove people towards the League of Women Voters Vote 411. It provides opportunities to learn about democratic processes in ways that they kind of organically learn about them, in particular about federalism, and it increases their confidence in navigating government information resources. So Mary? So, some of what really made me happy and was somewhat unexpected, um, but had been hoped for <laughs> was that we began, I heard students as they're standing in line and our students came and you know they just moved us so much because our students came and stood in line for over an hour in order to do this in 2018. And then many of them went and then they got their friends and they stood in line with their friends again. But we were hearing and overhearing them saying things like as you had students from say one of the Carolinas standing next to a friend that was in Massachusetts, the difference in the barriers that are created for voting, for exercising your franchise became very apparent. And rather than me, I'm very aware of the fact that I am a 50 year old woman. And rather than me sitting around saying, let me tell you young people of today about voter suppression instead, because I know how I would have responded to that from a 50 year old person when I was 18. I mean, you know, um, instead I was overhearing students say, wait a second, why is it so much harder for me than for my friend? And it's like, oh, well, why do you think it's so much harder? And they were like, they don't want me to vote. So it was a really powerful lesson, I think. And this is something that we often talk about for them to see that a lot of these barriers, they're at the state level. They're at a more local level and that those elections are also very important. And it makes federalism very, very real and visceral in those moments. So part of this is that they are within themselves and within this organic process engaged in civic literacy uh, learning. Mary? So 
A couple of the other things, um, it, like I said, it became very, very obvious when they were standing next to each other and we had a board out there with like all of the different states that have like voter ID requirements because that way we were making copies. They were able to see in a very visceral way without us having to point it out that some states suppress voting rights and some expand it and that therefore there are choices and that there are um, places of engagement at that more local level that they need to be aware of. Also, an ex Explicit thing, as I said, American University is in the District of Columbia, and we do not have the full rights of citizens in this nation. And that was completely explicit because what I did not want is for people who were eligible to vote in a different state in which they had full rights as citizens changing their registration into a place where they did not have those rights. And again, I mean, you know, for me, and I'm very glad to see that there was movement um, from the House, but of course, I, it's not going to pass right now on getting a state's right, but I do not think that it is remotely, remotely accidental that we are about 50% black and we are well over majoritarian people of color and we don't have full rights in the district. And the only way that's ever gonna change is that if we have people outside the district who understand and demand that their legislators change this system for which we have been cited by the United Nations. So anyway, it also allowed us to help them move towards uh, nonpartisan, high quality information resources and inter introduce them to the fact that these exist. In particular, we had partnered with the League of Women Voters and Vote411.org, which is an excellent, excellent site. And so if you are not familiar with it, a few of the things that they have there is that there are links to all of the registration forms. There are also places where you can verify your registration and your polling place. And especially right now, I would encourage us all to be ensuring that we help our students or our um, constituents verify their registration. I am concerned about voting purges, voting roll purges. And so this is a quick way to be able to do that and to have them aware that this exists is important. Additionally, there's sample ballots. And one of the things that I find so valuable about uh, Vote 411 is that they distribute surveys to all of the candidates in all of the different races, including the very, very local races. And they give the same questions to each. And again, you know, we need uh, to also help people be navigating and understanding the local elections, which is often where many of the changes like police reform, that's really where that has to happen is at the very local level. And again, Vote 411 provides this analysis of ballot initiatives that is really useful. So a couple of ethical considerations. We, um, in terms of higher ed and also public libraries, we're talking about like nonprofits or government information, so therefore, or government organizations. So therefore, I believe that it is important that we not endorse or even subtly endorse any particular candidate, party, political theory, et cetera. Um, but that what we are doing here is that we are promoting the structures that uphold democracy by trying to empower people to exercise their vote and to be engaged, informed citizens. So I think it's also important in terms of thinking through kind of freedom of information, privacy, nonprofit, nonpartisan, and also if you're going to use partisan, if you're going to use partners, which is part of where these ethical considerations are really important, making sure that the partners that you choose are in clear alignment with your missions and values. So for example, we invited, in addition to our student government and our alumni association, we invited the League of Women Voters in their entire, um, as one of our partners, and they, are, they were incredibly happy to partner with us, and I would encourage you to reach out to them if you are considering doing something like this, and I hope by the end of this you will be, um, because they are very happy to partner with us. And in fact, we won a national award for this from them. Um, but we did not invite the uh, local young Democrats or young Republicans because we didn't want it to have that particular flavor. So again, our main partner was student government and they are absolutely amazing. Um, so, they were very enthusiastic, but they don't return until August. Um, oh, I see in the comments, I'm just gonna put on this. Yes, it is very difficult not to endorse a particular candidate or a particular party when you have one engaged in voter suppression, but the way to do that, in my opinion, is to overcome voter suppression. So um, I, that to me is the way to, to do that. Um, 
So anyway, the student government, they're incredibly enthusiastic about these kinds of things, but they don't return until August. And they change over typically at the end of the school year. And that is just not enough time to get this kind of event organized from the ground up. So National Voter Registration Day is always in September and is set to ensure basically it's then because that's the latest date you can have and ensure that you meet all of the different deadlines for all of the different states. So what we are doing at American University is setting this up as a regular event that we're going to be doing every two years. And then we invited the new president and vice president of the student government into planning meetings as soon as they return. And we basically used um, our partnership with student government. We gave them two roles that they can just do better than anyone else. One is that they have direct communication with the students. And then the other is that they have volunteers, because I think that there is a very different perception of when you are getting, as a student, a message from your student government saying, in partnership with the library, we are doing this thing that is very empowering for you and getting a message just from the library. So the other thing that we found that was really powerful was that throughout the year, because this was such a successful thing, that student government would also reach back to us and ask us for things later on. It opened lines of communication with the officers of student government that made it a far more open, free-flowing communication and mutual support. And that was really, really valuable as an additional benefit for both sides. So a couple of our other partners that we have, like I said, we have our Alumni Association and the DC League of Women Voters, which I have now talked about, and our ethical considerations for having this outside groups, nonprofit, nonpartisan, clear mission, alignment with your values. And then the other thing that I would say is that if you are inviting external partners, you want to give them very specific roles. That just makes everything move more smoothly. And giving them roles that they are best able to help with. So, for example, again, student government's communication channels, they were amazing. They brought a lot of volunteers. We had a lot of volunteers come in from the League of Women Voters able to help us with different pieces of this, and they're very used to helping with voter education. Go ahead. So a couple of different things that we provided. This is basically what the library was able to provide. We did free printing and copying of IDs for anyone who needed them. We provided stamps and envelopes. One of the things that we found um, is that a lot of students don't really use snail mail, and we'll talk more about that in just a second. We provided computers and we gave assistance with the forms. And then one of the things that we also did is that we have a UPS store on campus and we coordinated with them so that we put everything into the box and we just took everything en masse to the UPS store store for them. There are some states, and again, this is a really, really good education in the way in which voter suppression is being used. Um, there were some states that required signed witnesses. And one of the things we said is we will give you signed witnesses. And if you need them for your ballot, you just bring them on in and we will be your witness. And then, um, as I said, you know, when they got their ballot, if they needed a stamp, if they needed an envelope, if they needed a witness, we just said, bring it into our service desk. We're here for you. Go forward. So a couple things that were surprising, but maybe shouldn't have been, but uh, you know, if I would have stepped back a little bit, but one of the things that became very apparent is that many of our students, they have no experience with snail mail. They just have never had to do it. And what that meant was they didn't know where to get stamps. Um, they didn't know how to address an envelope. And this isn't all of them, but it was a significant portion of them. And so actually our graphic designer upon seeing this dashed back to her office and made a poster that said, you know, Make your envelope look like this. Um, but you know, part of the reason to point this out is that what that says to me as someone who cares very deeply about people having the ability to exercise their rights as a citizen here is that if you wanted to suppress the young vote, you just make everything go on paper. So in going through this experience, they have now had the experience of how to do this. And it will not be strange and foreign in the future if they need to um, you know, if they need to do this in paper. Another thing is uh, that we needed a lot more computers. We had um, about 20 computers out and we had lines, like I said, that lasted for over an hour. They were incredibly, incredibly patient. They just stood there and they were so patient and dedicated. And this was really deeply moving to the library staff. Um, another thing that I do need to mention too is that a lot of our students, and again, you know, when you think about it, it's like, oh, well, why would they have ever dealt with this before? 
they've done almost all their forms online. They've never dealt with like paper forms, a lot of them. So what that means is that if all of their forms are online, then those forms use skip logic. And so one of the things that we discovered is that students filling out these paper forms, the idea that they are supposed to leave certain fields blank freaked a lot of them out. So again, um, I think it's very important for us to be thinking about having some opportunities for students to experience these things so that if it is ever used in a way to try to suppress their, uh, their vote, that they will have some experience in doing paper forms. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, Gwendolyn and I were going uh, probably 100 uh, miles an hour um, and then COVID changed everything just like it is changing everything for all of our lives constantly. Um, when Gwendolyn and I committed to um, trying to make this uh, a, a national event for universities and college libraries, we at first wanted uh, 20 universities and college libraries. As of February, we had 17 libraries committed. So just like everybody else, we are sad that we aren't going to be able to go forward um, the same way we wanted to, but we want to be very clear about the idea that we are going to figure something out this year, but our role has always been that we want absentee ballot woven in and integrated into academic libraries and all other kinds of libraries every two years. We are only at the very beginning, at the very beginning of and I will say this again, we are at the very beginning of this radical transformation that we are in. It's gonna take us probably 10, 20 years to make the society that we want, the America we want. So we want to say that we will pivot this year, but we wanna encourage everyone to begin integrating this into their schedules every two years. So what can we do now that COVID has changed all of our lives? So Gwendolyn's gonna talk about some of her ideas about how we can get this plan going. Okay, um, so basically um, we've got a plan <laughs> and I'm going to do it, I've got approval for it. So at American University, we're going to be doing this. And one of the things that I do wanna say is a lot of like the pre-planning and the prep for this I'm going to be doing it anyway because I'm committed to doing it at AU and so therefore, and we'll get into this, but we can share it and that way we don't have to duplicate effort and that's part of, uh, you know, our idea of reaching out there. So one of the first things that I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a little bit closer to time because we have all this stuff changing constantly with hopefully more and more places will pass mail-in ballots in general because we need it for this pandemic. But um, what we're going to be doing here is setting up, I'm going to go through all of the different states and pull out all the weird stuff for each state. And then I'm going to create some template emails that we'll be able to go uh, using our Department of Registrar and we're going to send them to each person. Like I would be able to say, Mary, um, we note that you are from Arizona. So here's information about how it is that you sign up for Arizona for your state mail-in ballot or absentee ballot. Here's all the weird stuff. And then we are also going to be creating something that will be absentee ballot week in which we are able to help them. But I'm first gonna send out um, emails that will, and I will create and make available the templates for all of the different states and the territories. So I think the next one, yes. So part of what will be included in that will be any weirdness that people need. And believe me, we found a lot of weirdness when we went and did this in 2018. So any restrictions? Do you need a copy of your ID? Do uh, you have to send it in in paper or is it an e-only situation? Do you need signed witnesses? And some of them make you do that. 
Um, do you need, um, like, is there weird information that we need? Like some of the things that we found in the Carolinas was like, they're like, oh, well, you have to have that original number on that card we gave you that no one has kept up with. And so we found like the sites in which you would go find that. Another one needed a precinct number. I mean, you know, nobody knows that, but at the same time, and again, it's like, there's no reason to have that really that I can see if every other state has managed to not need it, but we found the URLs and we're, we're gonna put all that into that email. Um, also like, you know, since a lot of our students, we know if they are from home, if they're doing things remotely for this, uh, this particular um, period of time, like how do they find a post office? How do you order stamps online? And then we're gonna give them the schedule of this is when we will be available to help you, signed by your librarians or your library, something along those lines. And that'll be that initial email that's personalized. So. So, um, so we're, once again, Gwendolyn and I are trying to move um, absentee ballot day to absentee ballot week, because most of the things that we're gonna to need to do this year are going to be remote. Um, so we really want to utilize our already created networks. So how can we do that? Um, we can, uh, we know that our students are still on social media. We know that our libraries, our student governments, our affinity groups all have social media. So we can build a, uh, well, we have the relationships with them, but we can use social media to continue to push out the this information, um, and we will and and so basically before September fifteenth, we have to get out there and make sure that we have all those relationships. Um, also, we will need to talk to the person who runs or the people who run our websites because we will want to put up a banner or some you know some kind of alert using the month of September to welcome the student back in and also to make them aware that we are going to be highlighting all these voting rights and voting suppression um, from September 15th to the 22nd. Great. So the other thing that we're going to do on the on that week, absentee ballot week, is that which we're going to do this from September 15th to September 22nd is that all of us pretty much I think probably have a chat queue that we're using for like research assistance or what have you and what we're going to do is we're going to create a special chat queue like for us we're using library help and we are going to have that staffed for help with the forms and therefore like if somebody is needing some additional help with the forms they can just pivot over and we can take them over to Zoom and see what it is that they're looking at and we can help them. And then for those that require paper copies or copies of IDs when the student does not have a printer or copier, um, this is what we're gonna do at AU. And we're gonna have a form that they have to agree to that they're okay with us doing this, but they'll just click something, but they will email a PDF to us of whatever it is that they need printed and ask them to take a picture of their ID if they need that. And then we're going to print all those up. We will fold them, put them in envelopes, have stamps, and we're basically going to have a situation that is like a theater will call set up, which we will have it available for them 48 hours later. And all they have to do at that point is take it, sign it, and drop it in the mailbox. So that's kind of our immediate plan there. So, uh, so basically, um, I'm going to talk about the types of things that we can do virtually. Once again, um, these are the things that we have to, as administrators and librarians and library workers, kind of start to work on now. So once again, we need to get our webmaster or our web person um, or the web team to agree that we can take over a portion of the website um, from February uh, 15th to the 22nd. We will create a chat design border because my business, Fearless Future, um, is a graphic design business and, and uh, my business partner and I have dedicated ourselves to the fact that we are going to make these things for all of you because, well, this is the most important election of our life and the beginning of our transformation. So um, we will do that. Um, one of the things that I'm most excited about is that we are going to create a website that is gonna be called The Wall of Shame. 
And when, as, as we've alluded to, and we keep saying that like, there's all these weird things. And what that really means is voter suppression. When you tell someone that they need two witnesses to sign up to vote, that is voter suppression. That's it. So we are going to make, um, uh, my business partner and I will make a website that highlights all those strange things so that even though we're not having students standing next to one another, hopefully through this interactive experience, they can say like, wait, whoa, so South Carolina is very different than Massachusetts. So um, then we also want to make social media badges for um, the students and say they voted absentee or they voted mail so that they can share them with their friends and really build from the 15th to the 22nd as we talked about earlier, as Shante talked about earlier, September 22nd is always National Voter Registration Day because that is the last day for all the states to get your voter um, application in. Mm -hmm. So we know we're giving you a lot. We know that everybody is pivoting. We know that everyone is struggling, especially um, in I mean, in all of our school systems, we know that things are very um, unsettled. And depending on what state you're in, we, you may have guidance, or if you live in a state like mine, you might have absolutely no guidance. So we understand that you are dealing with all these priorities and that they are shifting literally by the hour. So what we want to do today is make sure that you know what we can provide to you to make this easier. So. Gwendolyn has already set up a listserv and we can, you can join that listserv. We work together as a cohort. We will not send any random emails on that listserv. There will not be any chatty chat. It will only be about this project. Gwendolyn has also created a toolkit that the, the link is on the last slide. And once again, we know that life has changed for all of us. And a lot of the toolkit is obviously based on um, in person, but it's still excellent in terms of budget and all those types of things. Um, we will, through my, fear, my work at Fearless Future, we will create branding templates for all of you. Uh, Gwendolyn has already created templates for correspondence. If you choose to join with us, we will have a social media calendar. We will make things to share if you don't have access to a graphic designer. And finally, what I'm most excited about is that we get to design and code the wall of shame for everyone to share. Yeah, and Mary, just to piggyback on that, part of the reason for the wall of shame, which you know, I will be pulling all of that information together because I'm gonna be providing templates for all for letters for all of the states. And then that will um, you know, be the kind of information that will go on the wall of shame, but the wall of shame will also mean that when any of us are um, staffing those chat queues that are special for helping people with the ballots, because if you're doing absentee ballots and you're in a uh, institution where people can literally be from anywhere, that way you will have one place to go and be able to see everything that you need to know that is specific and weird for you know that state and whatever voter suppression there may or hopefully may not be, but you know, our experience is a decent number of them are pretty bad. So basically we want to see if any of you can join us in this. Once again, we know that you are handling a lot of different priorities, but just know that we will um, go through this process with you. We will provide many things. And um, here is the email link for, uh, Anna says that she loves the fact that, um, uh, Gwendolyn's email is so easy to remember, which is Greece, <laughs> and mine's Mary E at Fearless Future, and we really encourage you to write us, and um, now we are done, and we can't wait for your questions, so I'm going to stop sharing. Oh my goodness, thank you so much, Mary and Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn, did you get a chance to introduce yourself at the beginning? I think you just went. <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I got, for some reason, I suddenly got put in as a um, as a participant. So I was hearing, but I was like, I can't get over. So I apologize. I'm just so happy to be here. My name is Gwendolyn Reese, and I am the Associate University Librarian at American University in Washington, DC. And as Mary had said, we had worked together for a long time and um, just, I had initially proposed this when I was like, 
I've got to do something in 2018. And what I don't want is for people to be leaving a place where they could be voting for somebody who had a voting member of Congress and registering in the district where we don't have one. So that's kind of the, the history of how this initiative started. But thank you so much for having me. Thank you. That's great. We have some good questions. So let me start off by asking, is it possible to get sample ballots from all around the states to use for a program? Um, the sample ballots are on Vote 411. So, you know, the League of Women Voters does that as a matter of course. They have, and it's really useful. Again, like I, I do strongly recommend, and I, I have since joined the league as well, but they have, that website is kept up and they have sample ballots all the way down to every local area so that you can go through, do your research, make your decisions, and you could print out whatever it is that you want. Yeah, so they've got them. Great. Um, next one, how are you thinking about the absentee ballot event this year in terms of social distancing? We're trying to figure out how to do NVRD this year without a heavy emphasis on tabling and things that cause crowding and it's tough. That's a good question. That's a great yeah. question. So, um, you know, and I think that idea of like, if you can do something, if you're in an institution where you can do a mailing and if I, if I don't get the ability to do the mail merge, we're trying to figure out the technique of that. Then what I'm gonna do is ask student, um, student government to send something out as an email to everyone but that would alert them to kind of like, here's the, the chat queue, because a lot of them are pivoting to being able to do this online. But then if they can't, I really am gonna use that kind of theater model of like, if, if we can help you fill this out and then you email it to us, we will print it and fold it. And then all you gotta do is show up, just say, hey, here we are, here's my student ID so we can look through and like hand it to them rather than having the long lines. The long lines were really cool from the perspective of like, you know, powerful and I hope someday we can go back to that but that's how that's how we're planning on doing it here. Yeah can I add to that Chante is that um, so much of this um, and we were talking about this when we were all talking earlier so much of these events and like going to the polls you know it is a celebration like you know when we get together and we're activists together we love it we feel good we love being together but and so much energy and like we said people learn from each other but that's why we keep saying like, we want to institute this every two years. This year might be a hodgepodge of different things, but let's as librarians commit to making civic literacy central to all of our students. Okay, I do know that some schools have, um, they've had by volunteers and they call themselves social distance ambassadors to help make sure the lines are not close together. So just wanted to share that. that as well. Yeah, and, and for other things, we will have like, you know, the, the um, graphics on the, the line kind of, you know, here's your X sort of thing. So if we need to do that, but I'm really trying to make it so that we don't have to, to even do that. I want us to just have like the quick will call, but I guess we'll see how that goes. <laughs> okay, the next question comes from Shane Smith. So, says, thank you for sharing all this great info and these ideas about how libraries can drive voter engagement. This is so useful. Are there also plans at some point to offer ideas for helping folks get engaged if they are not eligible to vote? Ooh, oh, oh, I got that. You want me to take that? Go okay. for it. Okay. Um, so, Gwendolyn and I come at this a little differently. Gwendolyn is, um, you know, an AUL at a library. I took a different path. Um, I went and started my own business, insane. And so I am on um, the ground working in Arizona. And, um, oh my God, I totally just forgot the question. Oh my God, Chante, tell me the question again. Oh my God, what is wrong with me? They want to know if you have any ideas on how to engage uh, people oh, yes. not eligible to vote. Yes, so when we go out and do get out the vote in Arizona, um, many people do not realize that felons, people who were felons, um, can go through a restitution process and they can vote. But one of the things that is of um, great, it is a priority for us as Get Out the Vote, is to make sure that we are um, supporting local, a 
initiatives that allow people to get back into the voting stream if they have been incarcerated and at any certain time. And we also are encouraging people that if they live in blue states where that has already been taken care of, they need to push, like we all pushed the Florida thing. And then Florida was like, oh my God, they all voted to let felons vote, you know? But the truth is, is that I've never seen this in my lifetime is that we have like a national coalition now. So if we have to work on Florida, then we'll all push towards Florida. But it is essential that we make sure that people who are formerly incarcerated can vote and it has to be one of our priorities. And I'm gonna add one more thing here, which is something, you know, Mary uh, has taught a class to up and coming librarians on uh, civic literacy. And I think that is something that all of us could be doing also because like uh, with our public affairs librarian and I have done a couple of like tutorial scripts and various things, because I think one of the other things is you may not be able or eligible to vote, but that does not mean that you can't um, contact your, uh, you know, the people who are the elected representatives are supposed to represent everyone and also things like, you know, sometimes commenting on, uh, commenting on regulations, stuff like that. So I think, you know, all of these different places, the more that we can get involved with like, um, so our public affairs librarian and I were working on kind of a, a thing about like, where are all the levers of power that you have available to you? And a lot of those are available for people who are not able to vote. And so, you know, just trying to get some of that out there. So the information literacy for the purposes of civic engagement is something that I think is very critically important and an important role, I think, for libraries of every type. Okay, we're getting a lot of questions, so. I don't want to miss a question. So I know that we have someone who wants to make sure they have your email address. So I know I have Anna. Maybe she could put that in the chat. So you're going to be getting people hitting you up. Yes. Uh, and I will say, I really do have the easiest in the world. If you remember that I also Pri am a, a priestess of Athena. <laughs> it is Greece, like the country, at American.edu. And that's just my name. I didn't even ask for it. So Greece <laughs> at American.edu. And I can pass it on to Mary. Yeah. And mine is just my nickname, Mary E, because I have an incredibly long last name. <laughs> Mary E, like Sheila E. No, it's all good. <laughs> That's exactly. <laughs> okay, so we have Kimberly who wants to know if, they, if she's allowed, and anybody else who's watching this, to share your video and slides on their website if they give you credit. To yes! Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so now we have Chris Guy who says, would Vote411 or other online groups have tips for students to strategize or select candidates? Something to help them figure out to make decisions and evaluations or other recommended resources to help them decide what's important and how to make sense of the world of politics. That's a great question because oh. we just got Kanye talking about he wants to run for president. Hello. Yeah, what's so, going on? Yeah, well, Vote 411 does that. Uh, I mean, it's got a number of things that it does. I, I really do find it the most powerful site for any kind of like voter empowerment. And the reason why is that they send out to every single person, like I said, the same questions, um, you know, the same kind of important questions. And then they put their answers next to each other. And so you can see them next to each other. Apples, and, apples. Uh, they also, for um, ballot initiatives, they do some analysis for you, which in various states that have more of a direct democracy kind of thing happening, that can be really important because they can be difficult to read. Um, so they do that both from the, the top, like the you know, national level, all the way down to who's running for school board or you know, your uh, ANC is what we have here. It's like your associated neighborhood commission. Yes. I mean, they've got it all the way through. And yeah, part of and my thing, personally, I will say is like, you know, if I'm looking at a candidate and they haven't bothered to answer the League of Women Voters, well, that tells me a lot. I, you know, that literally has made a difference for me on quite a number of cases, but yeah. And, uh, and Shantae, if I can do my usual civic literacy speech, is that um, if you have students who are confused, I would say there's two things that we really need to explain to our students. For whatever reason, in our culture, we spend 80% of our time talking about the president. The president is not affecting our everyday life. 
our city council member is, our mayor is, our county people are. Like we talked about earlier, Doug Ducey, who's my governor, is really affecting my life right now. So if I would say anything to a student, it would be stay as local as you can and make sure that you understand that the more local an election is, the more influence you have over that person and the more influence that person has over you. And if we could switch 20% of the 80% of us who talk about the president all the time, we will win everything. And I will say, because I said this in our practice, I wanna be very clear to everybody. In November, we don't just win we destroy because we will have everyone on other sides of this history that we're living through trying to say that our votes don't count. So we don't just win in November, we have to destroy. Well, and to go with that, like, you know, for the, some of the really important issues that we care so deeply about, like police reform, that is definitely at the city level and at the state level. Anything at a federal level is, um, you know, it's not that it's nothing, but it's not, that's not the group that is going to be taking on police unions and things of that nature. So we've Absolutely. got to focus on that local ground game. Absolutely. Well, Mary and Gwendolyn, you destroyed this webinar. We are at time. And you guys rocked it. I know we could continue to talk about it because uh, I'm in New York. So my governor is uh, Cuomo and he has a lot of people who are crushing hard on him. So they're talking about him more than the president I say right about over here. But I do want to shout out uh, Stephen Thomas who said excellent webinar. And he wants to make sure that BCALA generates a civic literacy campaign on social media to help get the vote out. So I will take that on, Stephen. Thank you. And I want to give a shout out to Anna for really just creating this wonderful series. I know Anna will definitely make sure that I get this civic li literacy campaign on our social media channels. So Mary, if you got something specific for BCLA, we would love to have it. Oh, I will be there. I will be there. <laughs> thank you so, so much. We are at time 302. But thank you. I hope you enjoyed this webinar. I learned a lot and I was part of the practice route and they still blew me away. So thank, thank you, you so Shantae. Much. So much. Thank you so much. Have a great one, everyone. Thank you, Tony. Have a great day. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Gwendolyn. Thank you guys for being troopers through all of that craziness. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sorry. It just it took me a while to be like, ah, it's like I said, I had to switch computers because the other one, it was just, um, it somehow it had it like looped in with whatever the computer was. Jumping me into the wrong yeah. Oh, Shantae, let's talk about this social media thing in the future. Yes. Let's get, get it going. You. Yes. I, we have to make it, I want it to be really, really nice for us. And yeah. We want, yeah, we want to make sure we, we start sharing it ASAP. So everybody's like, oh, of course. Absolutely. This week. It's going to be just part of the everyday programming. So Yeah, and I'd love to work on that, um, Shantae, with you 